My life ain't been the same since my pops got locked up with Give me a pen and a pad, I need some me time Man, you know, man, we finna do a real big, man I'm gonna say the girl cute, but she bad news You can ask Pam, the new sealers is real dad Just know that, know that, know that, know that To get a feel for the very prolific and often misunderstood artist known to many as Rari, we took a trip back to where it all began for him, in his old neighborhood, Nightingale, Stockton, California. Alright, so why don't you go ahead and let us know where we at right now. Uh, we in Nightingale, southeast of Stockton, neighborhood I grew up in, we take you to this spot where in 02, I lost one of my best friends, Aaron Vickers. And, you know, it was really like one of them situations where it hurt because, like, I ain't never had, to, I ain't never experienced like losing none of my partners or none of that, you know. And we was just all standing out here chilling, talking, chopping it up like, like we usually do. And then the car just pulled up and they start shooting. We all got down, but by the time Aaron got down, he was already shot, you know? I was like, my best friend, we was together every day. We was together every day, you know? So it was like, that was like, we was like, we, that's all we knew was each other, you know? We had our little clique that, and that we hung together, and, and we were just tight like that. That's why I kind of hurt, because we used to always just talk about, like, how we all, you know, we all we got, so we got to stick together, you know? And he, we was always like, if something happened to you, it gotta happen to me. If we, if you fight, we all fight. So I just felt like that day when he got killed, like, like I just let him down because I just felt like I should have died with him because that was our thing. Like we're not gonna let each other, you know. I just, and that's for a long time. I just held that. That's what kind of bothered me because I felt like, damn, and I let my partner down, man. You know, because that was our thing. Like we had never let each other down, and we were just having this conversation like earlier that day about the same situation because we were sitting in traffic and there was another funeral line that was going by from another guy that had just got killed. <clears throat> we were just talking about it like, damn, man, we had never, like, we don't never want to go through that experience having to lose not one each other. So it was like, if that happened, then we all got to go, you know? So that kind of just bothered me, the fact that we just, we all were standing in this little bunch and they shot at this group and you the only one that get the only one that could hit, you know, and they shot hella times, you know, this whole wall, side of this wall was all shot up, you feel me? I think it's still like some bullet holes still on the side of this wall right here, because we were standing right over here, so, I don't know, it just, you know, it kind of bothered me for a long time, and it took me a long time to get over that. For a more in-depth understanding of Rory's upbringing, we went to the person who he says knows him best, his grandmother, Miss Reed, who still resides in Nightingale, in the very house that Rory grew up in. Well, he was a nice kid. I mean, uh, he didn't have too much of a choice because I was very structured with him and also working, you know. So, uh, he was a good kid, and uh, see all the pictures up on the wall and everything, so he was very good. So what age did he change? Um, I think around seven, 16, 
something like that. And what kind of kid was he at 16, 17? Well, he was living with his mom at that time. And so she wasn't as structured, structured as, as I was. Mm. So he had a little more freedom. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Were there anything that kind of kind of triggered in your head when he was younger that he would get into music as he got older? Or? Uh, not to my knowledge. I think he liked music, but I wasn't home enough to really notice that, you know, part of him because I was working like 12 hours a day and, oh, okay. and everything. And so, uh, but when I was home, you know, mm -hmm. they had to do what they were told to do. Right. Yeah. How you feel about James' music now? How you feel about his music? Do you listen to his music? Yeah, I like it, but I tell him he shouldn't use profanity. Oh, he curses a lot. <laughs> He say a few words more than what he should. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got a favorite song of his, or? Well, I don't just keep the, the CD to, to play it all the time, mm -hmm. but I have all his CDs. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's a sweet young man, though. Is he? Yeah. He's just too free-hearted. Mm. He gives all the time. <laughs> Oh, yeah. well, that's a good thing. No, at times it's not. <laughs> at times it can be bad to give away. Well, I mean, you know, when you need it yourself, why should you oh, give it away? Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good-hearted person. Yeah. Hmm. You know what? I noticed being around him that the ladies they just love him. Do you do you know why? No, yeah. they just <laughs> fall for him. I don't know why. He, he be minding his own business and, and the women just fall for him. They just fall for him. Yes. Because I be trying to figure out what it is about him that just make him go crazy. I don't know what it is. They just, they look at him and just <laughs> go for him. Must be his handsome face. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Most of Rari's young life consisted of his mother and father struggling with addiction, which resulted in him and his siblings being left in the care of Miss Reed. Why don't you tell me a little bit about growing up and having your mom and your dad in your life, or did you have your mom and your dad in your life? I mean, when I was little, my mom, my grandma had me. I never lived with my mom at all growing up. I mean, I knew who she was, but she was on drugs and stuff in the streets. My dad, he was, you know, doing what his, you know, doing his own thing, you know. But I seen him, I seen my mom, and I seen my dad. But my grandma raised me, so like, as a kid, it kind of bothered me, like a lot, you know, because I wanted my mom, but you know, she was out there in the streets. So when you say you seen him, did like they she would, like my mom would come over. Like sometimes my grandma would even let her, like let her come in, you know, because she on she was on drugs, bad. You know, I actually seen my mom get wrestled down in the yard by the police because my, my grandma would never in one night. She came up here, my grandma called the police. My mom was out there trying to fight the police and stuff, so you know, that kind of, yeah. you know, that kind of hurt my feelings. And then you know, I would walk to school and I would see my mom standing out there some days, you know. I just be like, man, I just, you know, I knew she was on drugs, you know, the little kids would be like, hey, mom. So, you know. Like for for years, I just I kind of held like I resented my mama for that, you know. Like I really, I just felt like why she wasn't here, mm -hmm. you know. My dad, he I seen my dad a lot. He really wasn't in my life like like all the time, but I seen him a lot. He and it was like he always came at the right time, you know. Like when he do come, you know, he, he always made sure I had the best of whatever, you know, the new the newest shoes and. And, you know, and he'd come talk to me and just give me a little bit of game about what I was doing because he knew I was out in the streets. Mm -hmm. And he'd just go about his way, you know. But he, you know, but he knew everything that I was, even though he really wasn't around, it seemed like he always knew what I was doing, though. Like getting some trouble or getting into it with somebody or getting trouble in school. I just wonder how he know. So even though he wasn't there, 
being that he always knew and it would just pop up when I did something, it just kind of was like, okay, he, he, he not in the home, but he, you know, he know what's going on. Young Rari harbored a lot of resentment growing up, but he's proud to say that he loves his mom and dad with all his heart, and the relationship today is much better. My mom is like, when I got older, it's, gonna, it's like it took me years till I was grown to just forgive her for how she just left, you know. And it, and what made me forgive her was the fact that like she could have left us in a foster home. She could have left us just. She could have just kept us with her, and you know, we could have just been just out here in the streets with her. But you know, she dropped us off over here. So I feel like she loved us enough to just put us somewhere where right. we was gonna get raised better than she probably could have even raised us. So it's like I still, you know, I forgave her. You know, it took me a long time to just be like, you know, you know I'm not even mad no more. You know, but I was mad for years until probably like maybe a couple years ago. A couple years ago, mm -hmm. oh, wow, took a while. Yeah, but now it's to the point where I forgive her. You know, and then she, she. She do for my kids what she didn't do for me, so it's like she, you know, I just feel like she do that to make up for it, you know, like all the stuff that she didn't get to do with that for me and spend time with me and my little brother and sister. You know, she do that with my kids, so you know, it's like, you know. Rari admits that as a teenager, he made his share of mistakes, but he never realized that one mistake in particular, at the age of 15, would impact his life for many years to come. The second time I ever got into some trouble, we was all chilling. At this time, I was talking to an older girl, you know, that was older than me. You know, I was like 15 at the time. She was like 18. Yeah, I think I don't know how old she was. She was older. She was too old to be talking to me, you know. So me and her was in a little so-called relationship or whatever. And one night, you know, my cousins come over. They asked me, you know, I invite, you know, some, some females over that I knew, some older chicks, because they were older, you know, they was mm -hmm. all in their 20s. So I invite them all over, we all over there chilling, they smoking and everything going cool, you feel me? So one of the chicks, though, I've I been knowing her, because me and her kind of had our little Dylan's, which was my girlfriend at the time's friend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we all chilling at the house and we end up messing around and she ended up messing around with two of my other partners too. Everything was cool. My my girl at the time, she kind of get upset that her friend is in my room. You feel me? So I'm just like, I mean, she didn't know that me and her messed around, but but she mad at the fact that right. she in my room. So she get mad. She leave. She leave she her knew. there. Yeah, she, she, make, she knew. Yeah, she. So she leave her there right. with me and my cousins. You know. Long story short, the next day I get a, a knock on my door. Some lady. I don't even know who she is. She knock on my door, she asked me like, you know, could I open the door? Cause I'm talking to her, to her through the screen so she couldn't see me. So she was like, can I open the door? So when I opened the door, she just asked me what my name was. I told her my name is James. So she was like, you know, she knew I was young. So she just talking to me. Cause I'm like, I just had turned 15. So she's just talking to me like, you know, she asked me did I know who this girl was? And I'm like, yeah, I know who she is. And she said her name and I'm like, yeah, I know who she is. She was over here last night, so she was like, you know, can you tell me, do you know, she asked me my cousin's name. Yeah, I know them, they're my cousins. She was like, uh, my daughter was raped over here last night. And I'm like, your daughter wasn't raped over here last night. So this is your girlfriend's friend, right? Yeah, my girlfriend's okay. friend's mom is at the door talking right. about my daughter being, was raped over here last night. I'm like, no, she wasn't raped. So she asked me how I knew. I said, because I was here. So she tell me, you know, to tell her the story. So I tell her the whole story from the time that they got there and the whole argument between me and my girlfriend about, you know, her laying across the bed, everything. Only part that I leave out initially was the fact that me and her had messed around too. I never told her that in the beginning. I just told her, you know, she messed with my cousins, but it, they didn't rape her or nothing. And, you know, she kept like, she was getting upset because... She figured if I wasn't in the room, how would I know what they didn't do? I was just like, because I know her. She comes over here all the time. This ain't the first time that she didn't did this. Like this is what she do all the time. Like, so her mom is just really getting upset with me. Like you don't know what they were doing if you wasn't in the room with them. So I, I had to just come out and admit that you will look. I messed with her too that night, last night, and I know I didn't, I didn't rape her because I didn't mess with her before. 
Like, mm-hmm. I know I didn't. So she get all upset. Oh, I know you raped my daughter because she wouldn't do that. So she ended up leaving and calling the police again a second time. And that's when they came and picked me up. So initially, the girl never mentioned my name at first, you know. She never mentioned my name in, a, in a, a, the first time that the police came. I mean, they called the police already. I guess they had already called the police when the mom came to my house. Right. So she never mentioned me until I mentioned myself. So when the mom called the police the second time and they came to question me, I told the police the same story again about what happened. This time I just told them, you know, I messed with her. This is what happened. So they arrest me and they, you know, they ask me, they tell me, well, you know, we'll let you go if you if you can find your older cousins and they'll basically say that. Your older cousins, because yeah. at the time you were 15, right? Yeah, so they were like 20 something. Mm-hmm. They were like, if you find them, we'll, we'll let you go if they say, but really they wasn't gonna let me go. They just wanted to get us all. Right. And they was like, I'm like, I'm not finna snitch on my cousins because I really feel like they didn't they didn't do nothing. Like, why am I gonna go to court and say, yeah, I know they raped her when I know they did. She didn't get raped. They just, I don't know why, what that, what they would call that, or you know, they just dropped it to that. They dropped it from a rape to a sexual battery, and they said if all three of you guys take the deal, you will give you the deal, which I would only have to do like 90 days and get out, and I would have to register. But at the time, as a kid, I didn't understand what happened to register meant. I never knew. Like I just want to get out. I don't care what I got to do. You know, I'm fresh out of juvenile hall. I'm dating this girl. She's 14. I'm 16. And I meet her through my sister. Mind you, I'm only out of juvenile hall probably five, four, five months. You know, long story short, I get into some trouble talking to her because she I'm older than her. You feel me? Her her uh family get mad because they feel like I'm too old to be talking to her when really they don't know how old I am. They think I'm older because I'm doing grown stuff. But I'm just fresh out of juvenile hall. I'm not even. 16. I'm 16. She's you feel 14. me? Yeah, you feel me? So they like, you know, it's a big old commotion about that. Oh, he just got out of jail. I didn't get out of jail. I got out of juvenile hall. <laughs> you know, but they don't know that. They just know my name and what I'm doing. So you know, they end up calling the police and all of this stuff. But I don't never go to jail or nothing. So I'm, but I got a warrant out for my arrest. I had a warrant out for my arrest for like almost two years because it's, it's from Sacramento. I'm not knowing, you know, I'm still out here oh, living didn't my know life. About it. No, I didn't know that I had a warrant. So now I'm grown, now I'm 18. I had just turned 18 now. And I get pulled over just driving down the street with my friends. And they tell me you got a, a two year, like a year and a half old warrant from out of Sacramento. And I knew what it was about. I'm like, man, they So it's like now that I'm I'm 18 now it's like they can't send me back to juvenile hall because I'm, you know, I'm 18. So they end up just giving me eight months. They gave me eight months. I just took eight months. And when I, sh- I shouldn't even did, I should have fought it. You feel me? But I'm not, I don't, but I'm like, now I'm just like, man, now I just feel myself just getting caught up. Like and just dumb stuff that I don't really got. I didn't even do nothing, you know? So I'm like, fuck, man, I keep getting caught up. So now I'm on probation and I'm still trying to chase my, now I'm trying to get a little focus. Even though I'm still in the streets, trying to gang bang and stuff, I'm trying to get focused now. I'm trying to do the right thing. And this guy come up to me and said, you know, he offered me a, a, a chance to get signed to So So Deaf. So I'm like, said, all you gotta do is go out to Atlanta with me. Mind you, I'm on probation, I'm supposed to be leaving. Right. You know, I'm like, man, this is a chance of a lifetime. So I just said, man, I called my PO and was like, look, man, I'm trying to go to Atlanta, I can go, you know, I got a chance. And she tell me, no, I can't go. I just hung up the phone, and then when I hung up the phone, I knew I was going. I said, man, I'm going. So I went out to Atlanta with Curtis Brownlee, and um, and it was, and it, and it, everything didn't go like it was supposed to go. It was, you know, I feel like I got sold a dream, and I ended up violating my probation, and that's what sent me, that's what actually sent me to the to, to prison, it was just a violation, a failure to follow instructions. And they sent me to the prison for failure to follow instructions because I signed on this dotted line saying that I wouldn't do. I would basically do whatever probation told me to do. I would do it. And if I didn't, if I did anything wrong, they could, you know, they could send me to prison. Although the Atlanta trip was a bust, and as a result, Rory sacrificed his freedom, he was still determined to chase his dreams of music. 
And as of recently, that dream is fastly becoming a reality. Now that we in your element, you be, we nice and comfy, you lean back, we both in the boss chair. Oh, this is my, my Dr. Drake chair right here, man. I call it the Dr. Drake chair. The Dr. Dre. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me hear something you've been working on. Okay, yeah, this is uh, one of the songs off my album, Room Service. That's the name of my album, so this is the, the song, the title okay. song. Let me pour some champagne on your body, baby Blowing money fast, new six, shit, a body crazy Looking at life through all minds, you see things different Top is so close, yet it still feels so distant No top, yet a roof missing Getting top from this chick, she a brain surgeon Louis luggage for the flight, stab my passport Gucci scarf flying, I ain't even reached the airport Speeding up 101, I see the shoreline No ceiling, I'm in love with the sunshine I'm in love with cars, I love nice things One eye open, that's the type Type of shit that hate brings. So I learned quick, stuck to the manual. Yes. And read my Bible every day, that was valuable. Oh, yes. And kept my game face on, play hardball. Oh, Even though life tried to throw a curveball. It's like we don't abide by the same laws. I stay firm, still play through the bad calls. I'm getting money, so you haters better log on. Every time I took this 40 cal, I get a hard on. Cause she the only bitch that a nigga trust. So she right next to me on the tour bus. I swear I cried many tears when my man died. Black hoop looking like a ninja ring samurai Room service, I need some more rose Test my down, yeah I'm feeling like rose They say it feels so much better at the top I swear it feels so much better in the drop Wind in my face, no care in the world Shout out to Miss Lee, my favorite girl in the world And anything I got, Chris, baby, you can add it When I get my first million dollars, you get Before we get into it, so when you started rapping Who would you say, what artist influenced you? I mean, I didn't really get to listen to a lot of rap music and stuff because I had a lot of cursing in there. My grandma wouldn't let me. So, really, I had found a a tape, a, a, a local tape. It was Doja Click. I found it in a, a, a little a vacant house that we had broken into when I was young. And I took it home and played it in my karaoke machine my grandma had bought me. And all I heard was stocking this and stocking that on the music. So I was just, that's what made me really just want to rap because I'm like, I didn't even know we had rappers. Like, mm -hmm. stop them, you know, and they was like that to me. They like, I'm thinking all rappers are celebrities. So, you know, and then my mom was doing security at this nightclub. And she brought me home a, a Killer Tribe tape. It was a white cassette and, uh, called Home Alone. And then I heard them rapping Nightingale. And I'm like, you know, I know them in Nightingale. So I, that's just what made me just want to start rapping. And then once I started rapping, I got into the, the Tupacs and I was like, you know, the public enemy number ones mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. I'm being able to hear the Snoop Dogs and stuff. And so you've been rapping for for since for a long time. You yeah. ain't like the some of these dudes out here that just a nah, couple I mean, of years ago decided to. No, nah, that's why I'm like, even though I'm still young, I'm like way to vet out here because I've been rapping before all these dudes was rapping. Like you know, I was in the stores a long time ago. I was in Tower Records a long time ago. You know. I, I've been like rapping for years since I was a kid, so a lot of people know I've been rapping, you know. I ain't dropped a lot of albums and I ain't, you know, put a lot of music out, but people know that I've been doing it for a long time, you know. So at what point would you say you you start really taking it serious, like this is what I'm gonna do. I'm not looking to go to school, I'm not looking to get no job, I'm, this is what I'm gonna do, this is I would it. say about um Probably about five years ago, I just feel like I just took it serious. Like, this is what I'm gonna really do. I'm gonna go hard. You know, I gotta, you know, I started really just starting to put investing in it, you know, putting, you know, equipment to, you know, just doing all the stuff that it take to just take my music to the next level. My, you know, having my own studio, not having to go to nobody else's studio, man. trying to just build a team around myself that's gonna, you know, help me get to the top. All right, so. On top of you, on top of you writing all your own music, to my understanding, you do all the producing, the mixing, everything that got to do with the engineering. You do that all yourself, all right? right? Yeah, so, I do all of that. Okay, what made you, what made you take on all of that? I got tired of having to depend and wait on people, like you know, trying to get in the studio and they tell you, "Well, I can't record you till Thursday," and it's it's Sunday. Like, man, I'm high. I want to, like, I didn't wrote this song. I want to get in there and right lay it now. today. By right. the time I Thursday come, I don't even feel this song no more. 
So it got to the point where I just sat down and I, I, I learned how to do it myself. I ain't went to school for this and that. And I just learned it because I, I was so focused. I was so hungry for this music that I didn't want to wait on nobody to do. Be like, oh, you can't come in the studio until next week and all that. Mm -hmm. So I just learned how to do it myself. Right. So this has been a question of mine for the, I'm not going to lie, this is a question of mine for the longest time because I just don't understand. I'm trying to think which one is it, the, your rap name. Is it, is it Mondo? Is it Rari? Is it, what, what was the other one? What, Fanai? Fanai? It, Are these three different people? No, it's is not it, even, no, really it was, it was, my, it was growth as an artist. Like, Lil um, Mondo was, my dad was named Mondo. So when I was, when I was, I was his first son and his only son for a long time. So I was just always Lil Mondo. So it was like everybody knew me. Lil Mondo is really my sh my neighborhood street name. So I was always Lil Mondo, Lil Mondo. But as I got older, I wanted to be who I wanted to be. I didn't want to be no little Mondo. You feel me? Even though people still call me Lil Mondo because that's my dad. You know, but I wanted to just, I wanted my own self. I wanted to be my own self. So one day I just came up with this name, Fanai, F-N-I-A, the flyest nigga in America. But it was really like, I don't know where I came up with this. The flyest nigga in, in America. America. In yeah. America? In America. But it wasn't like, but, any, but anybody wait. can be Fanai though. Fanai is not. In America? Yeah. So you was the flyest nigga in America. I'm in, sitting next to the flyest nigga in America. In America. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to, I just wanted to put that out. Yeah. Flyest nigga in America. Yes, yes, yes. But it was more like, I just, I don't know what made me even come up with that, and it, it like, and I, I don't. That's why I just it, it was only, it only lasted probably six months, but my boy, Maserati Chris, he always was calling me Rory, but he was really calling me Ferrari because I always was talking about when I blow up I'm gonna get one. So he used to always call me Ferrari, Ferrari. He been calling me this for a couple years, you know, but I never thought about calling myself Ferrari or none of that. So one day I was rapping. And I just threw it in there, Rari. And I just was like, Ugh, I like how that sound. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know what? I'm finna, I'm finna go with that. And but my boy been calling me that, you know, because we call him Maserati Chris. Mm -hmm. So he just was calling, you know. You feel like your music changed with each name, or? Yes, I feel like I found myself. Like now when I, now when I do music, I don't have to try hard. It just come natural by, from my. You know my, you know my catchy hooks, my, you know my ad libs is crazy, you know, and I just feel like I found myself as an artist. Like if you you can hear the growth from the Lil Mondo gangster rapping to the Fanai kind of, I felt like even with Fanai I was still lost. I didn't know what I what kind of like I didn't even know my sound, but I feel like with Rory I got a I got a, a patent sound that when people hear it, they know that's what that's me. Hmm. When I come on and. They hear me, they know it's finna get, I'm finna get it popping. Yeah. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, the rap scene here in Stockton, what do you what do you feel like you bring to the table that the other artists here in Stockton don't have? I bring, I think I bring good, I bring that good music back. Like I wouldn't say I was the the the, the, the best lyricist, or I say. You know the craziest stuff, like you know, like Kendrick Lamar. He'll say some his, he real complex, like he's real lyrical. I wouldn't even say I was real lyrical, like you know. So it's a few cats out here that I feel it's more lyrical than me, but I just feel like I make the best music. You know, I really you can listen to my music. It's substance in my music. Like you can, you can, you you will feel me more than a lot of cats that you listen to. You know, even if they saying some stuff that, and you be like, oh, that was real lyrical, but. It's, you can't feel it. There's no emotion behind the music. You know, it's just a bunch of words that sound good. You know, I feel like that's what I do. I bring emotion. I bring, I bring that that feeling back. You know, that people can feel. You know, I want to be able to touch people. You know, when they when they hear like like oh that's how I was feeling. He was talking about me right there. You know, not just a bunch of stuff that's just over the top of people's heads that they can't. They don't understand that. You know, they don't. You know, sometimes you gotta dumb it down for people to feel it. You know, they don't want to hear all that stuff sometimes. Right. And so, you know, we gotta go into we gotta go into this pound cake remix <laughs> right now because I felt like when I heard it, 
-hmm. And then when I heard everybody's comeback, it was kind of like Lawrence Fishburne screaming, wake up in um, school days because <laughs> you really got people in Stockton going crazy right now over this track. I mean, Artists, fans, everybody. Yeah. I mean, I just really one day, my cutty GE, he sent me the pound cake. He sent me the, the original song okay. with Drake and Jay-Z. And I was just like, he was like, man, bro, this is this sound like something you would do. And I listened to it and I just fell in love with the song. And one day I woke up, I hear my boy Fargo and was like, man, come on, we're going to the lab, man. I got this pound cake remix I'm finna do. He said, what you finna do, man? I just said, man, I'm finna get on a bumper, man. I'm just finna wake it up because I feel like that's, I just feel like everybody sleep out here. Mm -hmm. Even the ones that's doing music, they not, they not bringing it. They not, they just, everybody just, they, they putting out that, they putting out a bunch of trash, you know, so I just feel like I'm, I'm gonna raise the bar and sometimes you gotta hurt somebody's feelings to, to make them step their game up. You mm. know, sometimes you gotta tell them, man, look, man, you, 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 you ain't good. So he gonna either show you that he is good or he gonna fall back and just prove you that, Prove what you said, you know. So I know, I, mean, I know a lot of cats mad, they you know. Mad. Yeah, they, you know, they, they. I mean, I'm mean, seeing. I know they getting a little disrespectful, but it's funny to me because another reason why I did it too is because I know I'm on my way to the top right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a lot of big things popping for me right now, and I really want to see. I really wanted to make people tell me how they really felt about me too. So sometimes mm -hmm. you gotta, you know. I never call nobody. I never said nobody was, I never really talked, I didn't talk bad about nobody. All I told them was they couldn't rap. You, you know, they got on their diss tracks, they talking bad, they do this, you know, they ain't gonna do nothing, but. Right. I just really made them show their true colors, how they really feel about me as a person, too. Not just an artist, They how they really feel about me as a person. So now, when I start really making moves, I know who to mess with and who not to mess with. I mean, a lot of them cats I wouldn't have messed with no way because they was trash. Right. But it, I just want, sometimes I make people tell me how they really feel. You know, and I feel like that track did that. You feel me? That track did that, you know. You said that you didn't say nothing bad about nobody on that on that track, but no. you said they could, you just said, I just said they couldn't rap. You just told a whole bunch of rappers that they could rap. You don't think that that... That was no, that's like saying that's like them telling me I can't play basketball. I'm not gonna call you a bitch or say you're not a good father or you a snitch or you whatever just because you tell me where are you can't play basketball, you whack. I'm gonna just be like either I'm gonna go to the gym and get my jump shot tight or I'm gonna just agree like man my, I can't play basketball. I just can't play. You know, I guess when it comes to rap they people just take rap so serious now. It's like everybody wanna do it. You could tell a person they can't golf and they'll accept it, but you tell a person they can't rap and they know they can't, they'll want to kill you. Hmm. You spoke on people like you. You spoke on people by name. You didn't just say Stockton rappers. You. What made you really call people out like that? Because I felt like certain people needed to know that they can't rap. They just needed to know that, and I felt like if I told them that they couldn't rap. Maybe they step it up a little bit or just get out the way, you know? Hmm. I don't care how many CDs you sell. Just because you sell 50 million CDs, that still don't mean you can rap. You just sold some CDs. You, you, you was a, either you were a gimmick or something happened where, I mean, you sold some CDs just because that don't mean you, can, you, you actually got the, you know, you should be doing it just because, you know, it's a lot of cats that, the, a lot of the names I mentioned though, this is not just how I feel, you know. I, I've heard this amongst all Stockton rappers. Everybody that I named, I've heard at least 10 other rappers, 20 other rappers from Stockton say the same thing. So I was just the person that said, you know what, I'm gonna voice it. And I'm, and I'm, you know, and everybody taking shots at me for saying these names, but a lot of people sitting in the background. Cali boys whack, huggy knees whack, Max whack, whip whack, Coke Kogan whack, Luck whack, Duff whack, but that's my nigga though. Niggas need to know what they in it for. I'm the hardest, you can't ignore it. Rick bought the club and niggas won't support it. I'm like, why you motherfuckers hating for? Rick, why these motherfuckers keep hating for? You the flyest nigga in the chair, I swear. I swear I wanna go somewhere. Let me talk to him.
Food chain died when Tyrone did. Tall didn't die for something that Tyrone did. He was at Cretius. Me tall, A.B. B. Houston, Adrian. And that nigga cocky. We all had a vision. All had a dream. All for one. One for all. We was all for the team. Talking about one of your close friends who passed away, Aaron. But let's talk about let's talk about tall, respect, and you know, rest in peace. Let's talk about him. I mean, I didn't know tall my whole life. Really, I just met him, you know. And I hear a lot of cats, they talk about that, like, oh, you got his name blasted on you after he dies. You didn't know him a long time. I didn't know you had to know a person a long time to, to care about him. You know, you can meet a person today and love him tomorrow. You know, I didn't know that you had to be, you know, I didn't grow up with him. I only knew him for a year, you know. But in that year, I felt like we did so much stuff. And, 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 and with me, our relationship was deeper because I felt like he helped me become a better artist because I was I was only out of prison for three months when I met Tall. You know, I had just did a violation, still trying to, you know. So when I come home, I, I meet Tall, and we did this song called Right Here. That was the first song we ever did, and ever since then, we were just tight. And I just feel like he, he helped me, you feel me, become a better person and an artist because he loved to be in the studio. There have been days that I wanted to go out and do other stuff. He'd call me, man, can you record me? And I'd be like, all right. And I'd stay home just to record him. And, it, and, 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 and you know, he probably kept me out of trouble, you no know, telling him what I was going to go out and do or what I could have been doing. So, you know, people don't understand the relationship we had. It don't matter if I didn't know him 17 years, 15 years. I knew him for a year. I never denied how long I knew him. I only knew him for a year. But I just felt like in that year, you know, we did a lot of shit, you know. And he was, you know, and a lot of people say, oh, that wasn't your partner. He didn't care about you or none of that. But I find that hard to believe because a person don't come sleep on your couch. Or he, they don't come they don't come to your house every day and fuck with you like that and don't care about you, you know? Right. So, you know, I don't I kinda let all that stuff go about how people feel like, oh, you didn't really know him and you know, that don't that don't really matter to me. You know, all I know is that when we was when we was together though, we you know, we made great music and that was my partner, so I feel like in honor of him though, you know, I got his name blasted on me. So whenever I go, you know, I rep for him though, cause he ain't here to rep for himself, you know, just like I did for Aaron, you know, I rep for Aaron for 10 years, strong, never in my music, my songs, all the stuff, you know, and I'm gonna do the same for Tall, I'm not gonna let nobody discourage me, like, oh, you need to quit talking about Tall, you didn't know him, I knew him enough, you know, right, you know, so. All right, so we in the booth. Yep. This is where it all happens. This, yeah, this is where it all is, takes is, place. This is where it get crazy. This is the, this is where the magic happens. I'm standing in history right now. Yes. This is going to be a historic moment. <laughs> <laughs> and to end this, I really need you to let people know who you are and give us just a beast 16 right now. It's only right. Y'all ready? Okay. I'm ready. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Come okay. on, Dave. Let's do this, man. Yeah. Let's go. Rari. Love. I used to have hoop dreams, then I had rap dreams, money was slow, so I went back to that coke thing, you know the triple bean pills, grapes by the pound, loaded the guns and hit my man and we went out of town, I gotta make it baby mama keep flipping out, I light a L and hella smoke the less intention out, now the V's are sweet, tasty like a pastry, doing the buck 20 in the latest GT, I gotta eat, I'm overwhelmed by the hunger, my ribs showing fans wanna take me under, I'm pissing Remy, middle finger out the Porsche truck, body full of Suds getting brains in the bathtub. See, I'm a straight stud. VVS is glistening. See, I ain't listening. Player haters whispering. Hide behind Louis. Pink stones in the bracelet. That's pink lemonade. I'm fly like a spaceship. Ain't no patience. Ain't no room for the stalling. Press in on my sidekick. Know the money calling. Mama keeps saying the game gonna be the death of me. So I keep my 40 cal lawyer and retain the feet. Really in these streets with my gang. Blow my money. Want a hundred more cars and fuck. Plenty more honeys. Live life. Have a ball. Be the code that I live by. Dead before the 
sign to be the code that I die by Count a million dollars on the loft of my high rise Chick from Brazil while I'm sipping a Mai Tai Money comes, goes, so do the hoes But now when I hop in the lamb, I gotta pull up the dough Summers was cold, my winters was hot Why will I stop? I'm a ball until I'm locked up or dead in the box Even then, through my kids, I'm still here Live my life to the fullest When I step up in the club, my team here Never been a coward, be a day in my life And since a kid, I love money cause the feeling was right She had the decency to spoil me and put up a fight So if I die chasing this chick, at least she treated me right Look, ooh Rory's intention in doing this documentary was solely to give a better understanding of who he is and where he came from. Many will continue to draw their own conclusions, and that's something he refuses to worry about. His main focus is to learn from his mistakes, consistently make great music, and be totally comfortable in the skin that he is in. Yeah, man, yeah, I get to you, man, I get to you. It's a different type of feeling when you make a pinch yourself. Come here all the time. Make sure the money is real. We're not dreaming. I'm really here. The local boy brought it. I'm really here. No, no three, man. Not three. Three. Yeah. 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 I'm getting excited. You don't understand. I love chicken. I don't know what it is. I just this love is chicken. This is, this is that nine-year chicken right here. Supposedly, this is the best Ray's chicken in stocking. It's better. It's that nine-year boneless chicken right here. See, you don't understand because I didn't have some chicken in my lifetime, so I'm a no. <laughs> you know what that is? That's boneless chicken? Yeah, get that. Uh, that bone that chicken? No, 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 no. See, no, you got to pick this up and eat it. Yes, but no, you got to look a whole big ass look. dress. Yes, oh, I got to dip it? And I was only $4 on the five No, 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 you messing up the experience. But I, <laughs> you can't, you messing up the experience. But I need experience. to taste it when it's just without the, the no, sauce. No, you might. don't. This is, this is the experience. It's the experience. Now hit that corner right there. I'm about to get real messy right now, but you know, I don't, I don't care. Hit that corner. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that bone of chicken. Mm. That's that bone of chicken. If you're a best chicken, it's supposed to be kind of tender. I don't know. Man, that's that bone of chicken. Bone that? You don't like it? It's good. No, that's pretty good. I'm not going to scoop it. Wow, make you feel good, and I really got it. Make it feel like this And I know it's been a while since you felt like this We can do whatever, it's whatever on me Baby, throw it in the bag, girl, it's all on me Show me